And then if we have time, we'll um, start tissues, okay? Um, I'm not quite sure what page this is on. Does anyone have an idea in the lab atlas? I want to say this is in the page like three in the beginning. Two or three? Two. All right, I was close. I was close. Um, so we finished up that portion of the digestive system there, okay? All those many, many slides. And you're going you're gonna to get into a little bit more detail when you get into 211 um, with some of the slides. Um, but just this, we're just trying to break up some of the material. So let's jump right into the urinary system here and hit a couple of structures uh, with the kidneys. All right. Uh, if you look here, keep in mind, and I can't stress this enough when you are taking the test, one of the things that you should be doing is scanning the screen and looking to see if, if there's words on the screen when you're taking the test. There's no words. It's an identification, right? An arrow pointing to something and you say what it is, okay? But if you see words, your first thought should be what it is that you're looking at, and then two, is this asking me to identify whatever that arrow is pointing to? If there's words on there, most times it'll ask you something else. Because I can't tell you how many times where somebody uh, identifies it correctly, but that's not what the question was asking for. It'll say something like, hey, what, what, what part, uh, what system is this structure a part of? And they identify it, oh, that's the left kidney, that's great, that's awesome. But, you know, the, question, the answer would be the urinary system, that kind of thing, okay? So just make sure, if you see words on there, you should be suspicious. Let's just say that, all right? It's like, hmm, this is probably not asking me to identify. And, uh, and sometimes it will, but most cases it's asking you something else, right? But if there's no words on there, and it's an arrow pointing to something, straight up identification, okay? You just kind of keep that in mind. I hate when people lose points like that. I just don't like it, with, so I'm telling you now, okay? So this right here, oh, and another thing too, make sure that you are able to identify the anatomical left and right sides, okay? Obviously this model is facing us, so our right, is this model's left, okay? So also I know it's the left kidney because the right kidney is lower than the left. Does anyone know why the left kidney is higher than the right? We're missing something here. What's missing here? The liver, that's right, yeah. The liver pushes the right kidney down, okay? So your left kidney is identified here, okay? A little bit higher than the right. All right, you can see it on this model here. I'm not sure what page this one's on, okay? Um, but again, this is pretty much showing you part of the circulatory system and also, all right, part of the urinary system. Here's the kidney, okay? Remember, if you see a tube-like structure and it's red, most likely it's an artery. If you see a tube-like structure and it's blue, most likely it's a vein. Well, here's a tube-like structure, but it's yellow. Your pee is yellow. Okay, so we'll, we'll identify this in a second, okay? But certain things, use color to help you out. Here's the right kidney, okay? And then if we jump over here, there's the right kidney on this model. Okay, so now you can see just above each of the kidneys, you got a structure up there that looks kind of yellowish, okay? And that is going to be your adrenal glands or the suprarenal gland. Either or is acceptable, okay? You'll learn about the adrenal glands and their functions in much more detail in the endocrine system, and that's in chapter 17 and 211, okay? So here's the left adrenal gland. It's right on top of the kidney here, okay? Or suprarenal gland. Here you can see, uh, these are a little bit out of order. So this yellow tube here leading from all right, the left kidney down to this structure here, that is the left ureter. All right, the ureters drain the kidneys into the urinary bladder. Okay. All right, left ureter. Here you can see on this model, the left ureter now it doesn't look quite yellow. It's more of like a tannish color. But again, 
look at where it's coming from. You see this tube here, right? I don't know if that's a nerve, even though you're not really responsible for any nerves right now, okay? But I don't know if that's a nerve, what that is. Just look where it's coming from. It's coming right here from the kidney, all right? It's descending all, right, all the way down here, all right, to the urinary bladder, all right, right down here. I know that this is some, I don't know what page this is on. Does anyone have an idea what Atlas page? Two. This is two. Okay. This is two. All right. I know that some, this is the only time I prompt, well, I shouldn't promise this, but this skips around. This first, all right, chapter, the, the general body plan skips around in your Atlas a little bit, all right? So some of the, some of the model, the slides are in the front of the book, some are in the back of the book. All right. Here you can see, you got page two, okay. Here you can see the right ureter, okay, draining the, draining the right kidney down into the urinary bladder here. And then I'll show you the ureter here in the body, okay. Here's the right kidney, all right, and then the ureter is exiting from the kidney and heading down here into the urinary bladder. This one's not in the book? Are oh, you saying page 91? Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, all right. You're saying this slide's on page 91. That one's on. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. So here you can see the left adrenal gland on our model, on top of the left kidney. All right. We all we already saw it in the actual body on that other model there. So you can also see here, all right, on the right side, we've got uh, the right adrenal gland. And like I said, you could also call it the suprarenal gland, okay? Supra just means above. Whatever works for you. Okay, so those are both the adrenal glands or suprarenal glands, all right? Notice that both the kidneys, the ureters here, will drain into the urinary bladder. You can't just call it the bladder. You have to specify urinary bladder. Okay? That is specific. All right. So here's the urinary bladder on this model. This is on page 91. Here back to page 2, you can see the urinary bladder. It sits down in this region here, and we're going to go through the different cavities, all right, of the body here after we're done labeling. All right, so just to kind of give you some perspective, right here, this, these white structures here, these are your hip bones. So when you were younger and someone told you to put your hands on your hips, you put your hands here so you can see how deep into the pelvis here that the urinary bladder is located. All right, now this is a mid-sagittal section, a cut. Okay, um, if anybody knows what page this is on, just four. Okay, page four. Okay, so you can see the urinary bladder and the mid sagittal cut here. All right, to, just to kind of give you some perspective and some reference, here is the anterior portion of the model. Here's the posterior portion. All right, this right here where the arrow is pointing to, that is one of your for lack of a better term, your butt cheeks, okay, your rear end, okay? So you can see here's the spine coming down, all right? So the urinary bladder is closer to the anterior portion of the front, all right? There's a couple other structures here that you're going to be responsible for here, and we're going to label them in a moment, but just to kind of help you out too, because I've seen it happen, and again, this is, I'm trying to give you hints to help you out with the test, all right? This is a female model. Okay, I don't see any external male genitalia on it. So women, obviously, have this structure here. That's the uterus, all right? There's been many times in which people have confused the urinary bladder and the uterus. So you, uh, my point being is I want you to understand the relationship here as we go from anterior to posterior, okay? The urinary bladder is going to be most anterior, okay? Then kind of sandwiched, between the urinary bladder, all right, and the rectum, okay, and the sigmoid colon, that's the uterus right there. And then this back here, all right, there's your rectum. 
Okay, so keep that in mind. All right. Um, what page is this one on? It's on the same page. Okay, okay. So now you can see this is a this is a. Um, let's close that up. All right. This is a male model. We can see the external male genitalia on there. So we're going to be missing the uterus. All right. So here now we only see two structures down in the in, in the pelvis. Here's the urinary. Here's the urinary bladder. Okay, and then directly behind it, here's the rectum. Okay, so there's no uterus there. All right, just kind of, I, I, again, I'm just trying to point some things out so you don't lose any points or uh, mislabel. All right, so now you can see here on this model, there's the uterus, all right, <clears throat> posterior, a little bit more superior. So if you're ever wondering why, all right, well, you already know why if you've been pregnant and had a child or children, all right, as baby gets bigger, all right, the, the, the uterus gets bigger and it presses and pushes down on the bladder and that's why pregnant moms and later trimesters have to go to the bathroom because that bladder is constantly being pressured by their, their baby, right? Um, the uterus, uh, this mo model is, does anyone have a page? Which one is that? 98. 98, 98. Okay, page 98. Okay. So this structure, and again, when you um, take 211, you'll get into more detail. You'll, you'll break down the different parts of the uterus and the fallopian tubes. But for right now, for our class, for 210, you just need to know that this arrow is pointing to the uterus. Okay. <clears throat> And then right down here, there's the vagina, this whole area right here, from the cervix down here. That is the vagina. All right, again, uh, I don't know what page this model is on. 97? 97. Okay, again, different model here. All right, now we're going back to page, what is this, four? I think this is four. All right, back to page four. You can see like this pinkish-like structure right here, okay? That's the fallopian tube. Also, you can call it the uterine tube, whatever you prefer, both. Um, uh, both terms are in your lab manual, so both are acceptable. Okay, fallopian tube or uterine tube, and okay, that's the tube that is going to be connected to the uterus, and it's going to be in close proximity to the ovary. That's where the egg travels. All right. So again, you can see it here on this model. All right, on 96, no, 98, right? 98. Okay. Can't see it, but the ovary is over in this area here. So the egg will travel down the fallopian tube into the uterus to implant. Okay. That could take up to six days. It's a long journey. All right. Here you go again the fallopian tube and the uterine tube. All right. Not to be confused. With this right here, this is a ligament. Okay. This is not a tube. All right, fallopian tube and the uterine tube. And then you can see at the one end of the fallopian tube, all right, in close proximity is the ovary here. Now, you don't have to be specific, right, left ovary, okay, for that, doesn't matter. Just print an ovary, okay. It doesn't matter to me. Here you can see it too. Again, you don't need to be anatomically uh, correct on which uh, ovary. All right. Um, 
moving on now to, uh, to continue on with the um, reproductive system here. All right, external male genitalia. Here's the penis on this model. There's, I think, three or four different models on this, so you're going to see a couple different um, models. So we're going to go through all of them. All right. I don't know what page this is on. 94. 94. Okay. Here you can see it on this page. Is this one also? This is is this also 94? Okay. And here it is. We saw this model already too. This is, I think, page four. Is it four? Am I right? I'm guessing. All right. So I told you there's a couple different models here, so you can see it from a couple different uh, uh, views here. Uh, again, this is what we refer to as a mid-sagittal model. We cut it right down the middle here. All right. All right. In our model here, posterior behind the penis, we could see one of the testicles or the testi. Okay, that is located in the scrotum. All right, that is where we produce the sperm. And then on this model here, on 94, this is pointing to the testicle or testi. Now, sometimes you'll see, we're going to learn what this structure here is in a moment, but sometimes if the arrow is pointing here, that is not the testy, okay? This actual um, ball-like structure, that is the testy. This structure here is something else, which we'll see in a second, okay? <clears throat> Here's the testy also on this model. All right, now we're moving up a little bit, going back inside of the pelvic cavity here, and just inferior to the urinary bladder, there's the urinary bladder, all right, just inferior to that, we are going to see a gland here. All right, that is the prostate gland. All right, you see it just inferior to um, the urinary bladder, and it's anterior to the rectum. Okay. Going to this model here, again, this is a sagittal cup, but not a mid-sagittal, but a sagittal. Okay, you can see the rectum, all right, from the outside, the urinary bladder here, you can see the prostate gland is just inferior to that. All right, and then also on this model, I'm not quite sure what page that's on. 95, okay. So this angle is kind of like a, thank you, Brandy. This is from, thank you, Brianna. Uh, this is from kind of a posterior lateral view. Again, here's the rectum right here, okay. Here is your urinary bladder, all right. This is, believe it or not, this is one of the ureters that's just cut, okay. And then right here, there's your prostate gland. Okay, so when I was talking about the testes earlier, right, you can see there's this ridge-like structure on top of the testy, okay, that is known as the epididymis, right? It's not part of the testy, right? It sits on top of the testy. Epididymis, here you can see it right here. Again, it's superior to the testes. It's kind of like ridge-like structure here. Okay. So, all right, the sperm is produced in the, in, the, in, the, in the testes, and then it's going to travel, all right, it's made on the outside of the body essentially, and then when it's time for that sperm to be utilized during intercourse, all right, as ejaculate, it has to travel into the body. So how it gets into the body, it travels through this tube, 
okay, called the ductus deferens, or it's also known as the vas deferens. Either or is acceptable. I just think it's a little bit easier to spell vas. Three letters versus six letters. Not a big deal, but still. Okay. And again, you don't have to say right or left. Okay. That is not necessary. Okay. The ductus or vas deferens is going to connect the external testicle to the internal portion of the body. Now, I'm going to tell you something right now. All right. This has been labeled, and I don't, how do I want to say this? The department and I go back and forth on some things. This is one of those things that we go back and forth on, all right? This, to me, is the ureter, all right? I think it's a horrible model because if you look back here, and again, you'll know more when you take the reproductive system, all right? This right here is leading towards the testicle. So label it. As the ductus deferens, the vas deferens, there could be test questions on it for right now, okay, for this semester, okay. Um, but in my opinion, not my opinion, all right, um, we just differ on that. All right, ductus vas deferens here, and then almost done, guys. Okay, we're going to talk about these um, cavities here in a moment. Let me just make sure I've gone through it. Yeah, okay. All right, good, good, good. All right, that's it for, for uh, those slides. So that's the first. There's, there's three labeling all right, uh, um, exercises or chapters for the first lab test. That was chapter one, okay? So you start to familiarize yourself with that because we still have to do tissues and skin. Skin is the shortest. I think there's only about 26 slides for that. Tissues is a little bit more. All right. But I would definitely take advantage of the weekend and label those. Or not label because you've already done that. Um, but I would definitely go over those, review those. Um, I want to jump back into some uh, lecture material here. But it pertains to lab. All right. Body cavities. Where are we? So both general body plan and tissues will be on the first lab test. Yes, that uh, general body plan is chapter one, um, tissues is chapter five, and skin is also on the, the first lab test. That's chapter six, okay? So we just finished all the identification parts for chapter one, okay? All right, so I want to talk about body cavities and membranes. All right, you'll see membranes throughout this semester, okay? There are actually four membranes in the body, okay? We're going to talk about the first membrane here momentarily, the serous membranes, all right? But let's start off by talking about the body cavities, okay? These body cavities are these spaces that are inside of our body, all right? And we're going to use uh, inside these cavities is where most, uh, well, where your organs are located, all right? So in order to eat, to better understand anatomy, all right, and the relation of, of uh, structures to one another, all right, we need to learn where the body cavities are and what they are, okay? So we're going to start off with the, 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 um, the two uh, uh, basic body cavities, and then we're going to get more detailed, okay? So our body cavities, all right, when we break down body cavities, we have the posterior aspect, right? So posterior is back, okay? And then the ventral cavity. Ventral is front, okay? So posterior aspect and ventral cavity. So we're going to start off first with the posterior aspect. So some of the characteristics that you should know about the posterior aspect is, one, it's completely encased in bone, right? So that cavity is completely surrounded by bone. So we're going to further subdivide the posterior aspect into two subdivisions. Okay, and they're listed down here. The cranial cavity, right, your skull, your head, okay, and the vertebral canal, all right, or the vertebral column. 
So your cranial cavity, which is where, where we have part of our central nervous system, the brain, okay? And then your spine, or the vertebral column, which has is the other part of your central nervous system, the spinal cord. So we break down the cent we break down your nervous system into two, anatomically into two two parts. Okay, you have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Your central nervous system is your brain and your spinal cord. Okay, so your central nervous system lives resides in the posterior aspect. Okay, so the cranial cavity, it's all the the, the bones that make up your skull. Okay. That's where your brain lives. That's one part of the posterior aspect. The other part is the vertebral column, okay? And that's where your spinal cord lives. Let me show you a quick picture here. Okay. So here you can see, right? Here's the posterior aspect, right? The cranial cavity, which is surrounded by the cranial bones, and then your vertebral canal, which is surrounded by your vertebral column, okay? And it's towards the back. Would you all agree that that's in the back? Okay. Okay. So that's the, the, the first division of our body cavities. The second one, all right, is called the ventral cavity. That's going to be up here in the front. Okay. All this stuff here. All right. So we're going to talk about that now. There we go. All right. So obviously, ventral being in the front, this this is going to be more anterior, right? and it's going to be larger, okay? But here's an important uh, uh, feature or right, characteristic. It is not completely encased in bone, okay? Only part of it is. So we're going to, again, divide the ventral cavity into two subdivisions listed below here, all right? The thoracic cavity, which is your chest, okay? So your chest is surrounded by the rib cage in the sternum in the front, in the vertebral column in the back, okay? And then you've got the other part, which is called the abdominal pelvic cavity. So if we dissect that word, abdomen and pelvis, abdominal pelvic cavity, okay? Not too bad so far, right? A little bit of memorization, I know. I mean, if you're a person that loves memorization, awesome. I was never a huge fan of it. I like the physiology stuff more, the more conceptual stuff. But if your anatomy is your thing, if you can memorize, I'm going to tell you. All right. So hold on one second. I'm going to show you the pictures here real quick. And then we'll do the um, membranes here. Okay. So here on the front, you can see here's our ventral cavity. All right. And so we subdivide it into the thoracic cavity, which is the chest right here. Okay. And then we got the uh, other uh, subdivision, which is the abdominal pelvic cavity. So here's something I want you to understand, okay? What divides the thoracic cavity from the abdominal pelvic cavity is your diaphragm, your breathing muscle. We, we identified that on Tuesday, remember? Okay, that makes up the floor of the thoracic cavity, okay? But it also makes up the roof all right, of the abdominal pelvic cavity, okay? So then we further subdivide the abdominal pelvic cavity. All we're going to do is pull the two words apart that made up the name abdominal pelvic cavity. We divide it into the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity. Easy to do. How, how to know where this is. Put your hands on your hips. Anything that's below your hands is the pelvic cavity. Anything that's above your hands, all right, but below the diaphragm is the abdominal cavity, all right? That's what we're seeing here, okay? That's where this line is showing us, okay? That's the abdominal cavity, all right? And then right here where your hips are, down here, that's the pelvic cavity. We'll show you on the front here, okay? There's your abdominal cavity here, and then down here is your pelvic cavity. Cool so far? Not too bad? Okay. Now we're going to divide, <clears throat> we're going to divide the thoracic cavity, okay? There's some subdivisions to the thoracic cavity. 
okay? So in your thoracic cavity, you have your heart and your lungs, amongst other things, okay? But your heart has its own cavity, and your lungs have their own cavity, okay? Their own little section, all right? So where your lungs are located, we call that the pleural cavity. Where the heart is located, all right, that is called the pericardial cavity, okay? Cardio, heart, okay? So pericardial, peri is around. So this is the cavity that surrounds the heart, all right? And then pleural cavity, that's the cavity that surrounds your lungs. And then right in the center here, okay, you've got this one stru cavity structure. That's called the mediastinum. All right, we'll talk about some of that stuff, okay? But that should be the end of the names for our body cavities here. Okay? So, again, it's just going to take a little bit of memorization here on um, learning where those cavities are. All right. So these cavities, okay, have all these little compartments and whatnot. And these compartments or, or subdivision cavities are lined, all right, by some membranes. And that's what we're going to talk about now, okay? All right. So keep in mind, all right, when we're talking about the posterior aspect and the ventral cavity, all right, when we're talking about the ventral cavity, all right, we, they are lined by serous membranes. There's four types of membranes in your body. Serous membrane is the first one, all right. The second one we're going to learn about in Chapter 6, that's called the cutaneous membrane. That's your skin. All right, then you also have what's called the mucous membrane. And then the last membrane in your body are synovial membranes. And those are found inside your synovial joints. All right, we'll learn about some of those later on. Okay, so our serous membranes are made up of two layers. Okay, two layers. This is an important concept because we're going to talk about this throughout the rest of 210 and 211. Okay. So does anyone know the name of, of uh, another name for organs in the body? It's up there on the board. Viscera, okay? So another name for organs is viscera. So an easy way to remember this is if the membrane is covering an organ, we refer to that as the visceral layer. Okay, it covers the surface of the organ. Okay, so if I have a heart, all right, and I'm pointing to the heart, it's covered by one of the layers of the pericardial uh, membrane there, and that is going to be the visceral pericardium. Okay, it directly covers the external surface of that organ. Okay. So the other layer, right, is called the parietal layer. And this is going to line the inside, all right, surface of the body wall. Okay, and I'll show you. I'll explain this to you. Between these two layers, we have a, a small, very, very small, okay? And that's called the serous cavity, all right? So just a quick review, serous membrane, right? It's a two-layer membrane that we find in the ventral cavity, right, in the front part, okay? So it's two layers. One of those layers, usually the innermost layer, is going to cover the organs. So we call that the visceral layer because the organs are called viscera, okay? The other layer is called the parietal layer, that's the layer that is going to, it's still going to be on the inside of the body, but it's going to line the internal surface of these body cavities, okay, or the body wall, depending on where we're at, okay? And so in between those two layers, we've got a small cavity, and we call that the serous cavity. In that cavity, we have this stuff here, serous fluid. I love serous fluid. You should love it too. Because if you didn't have serous fluid, every time you took a breath in and out, your lungs would tear. It'd be painful. Okay? 
because the serous fluid acts as a lubricant, all right, between the parietal and visceral layers, okay? And what it does is it reduces friction, all right, as the organs move. So, um, is it bad for a baby to be born, well, first of all, what's the normal length of time that a baby should cook? Not an oven, all right? A normal amount of time. What's What do we usually shoot for for babies? How long should they be inside a mom? Well, nine months. Let's uh, let's do weeks. Usually about 40 weeks, roughly. Okay. So is it bad for a baby to be born at 22 weeks? It's not good, right? We can all agree on that. Um, 41 weeks. Yeah. Okay. So we can all agree on that. So it's not a good thing for a baby to be born because at, at that time, because we call it a premature baby. Okay. At around 25 weeks, babies all right, start to produce a substance in their lungs called surfactant. Has anyone ever heard of surfactant? Surfactant is the name for the serous fluid in the pleural cavity. Okay, And basically what it does is it helps to reduce friction. All right, so its job is to make sure that the lungs can inflate and deflate properly, all right, especially when the baby's born, all right, even though the baby's not breathing air when the baby's in the placenta, right? It's still got fluid in its lungs and everything. But if it's born prematurely, it's got to start breathing sometime, right? So it does not start producing this serous fluid, this surfactant, until about week 25, all right? So if a baby's born prematurely, that's why what one of the treatments, does anyone know what, what you give it to a baby if it's premature to help it develop, uh, produce surfactant? Steroids. I feel like steroids are the answer to a lot of things, you know. But, yeah, you give them the steroids, they start, unless they're really premature, if they're less than 20 weeks, that's a whole different story. All right. But that serous fluid acts as a, a lubricant, all right, so it reduces the friction. So when the lungs are inflating and deflating, all right, they're not get, uh, destroying themselves. Okay. All right. Well, we already saw that. So I want you to think of serous membrane. Excuse, yeah, serous membranes with this example in mind. This is in your book, I believe. All right. Blow up a balloon. Take your fist. Smash it into the balloon. So for lack of a, of a better um, Example, let's pretend your fist is your heart, okay? Similar shape, you know, kind of round and whatnot. So if you notice here on our picture, okay, here's the fist, here's the organ, okay? The part of the balloon, all right, that directly covers the fist, that's going to be the visceral, all right, layer. Remember what we said, serous membranes have two layers, the layer that covers the organ's external surface directly is the visceral layer. So this dark blue line that you see here, or what we call the inner balloon wall, that's the visceral serous membrane. And then this outer dark blue line, all right, that is going to represent the parietal serous membrane. And then the space in between here, that's the serous cavity. And so we would be producing that serous uh, uh, fluid in that cavity, okay? So this is, I love this. I think this is a great um, uh, example to kind of explain that, okay? So some of the other structures here, because we're going to get to a little bit more specifics here, so you know the relation between the body cavities and the serous membranes, okay? Um, the When we talk about the thoracic cavity, we have some subdivisions inside the thoracic cavity, all right? The first is the mediastinum. So media, right here, think of median. Anything that's median is directly in the middle, okay? Right in the center of the thoracic cavity, all right? I've seen it on a test, so you want to know, all right, the structures that are found within the mediastinum, okay? The heart, all right, the thymus. Does anyone know what the thymus is? It's a small gland. Okay, and when you're a baby or, or a little kid, it's quite active. It's a place where your white blood cells, specifically your T lymphocytes, go to grow up. They mature there, and they get tested, so it's almost like school. 
all right? They go to there and the thymus gland is going to challenge them and teach them, uh, well, not really teach them, but it's going to test them to see if they can tell the difference between your own body cells and a, and a, and a foreign invading cell, all right? And if they don't pass the test, they die. Thank God school's not like that, <laughs> all right? So, okay, so the thymus gland, you've got your esophagus. We saw where that was, all right? That's your swallowing tube, your food tube. All right, trachea, we all know that, the windpipe. And then we're going to have, all right, some of our major blood vessels, all right, they're going to head to, like, the aorta, okay, parts of the aorta, all right? All right. So the other uh, subdivision of the thoracic cavity is going to be what we refer to as the pericardial uh, cavity there, okay? And in the pericardial cavity, we have the pericardium, all right? That's the name of the serous membrane there. So going back to this slide, come right back to the slide, but going back to our example slide, that's what we're going to be talking about here, all right? So think of this example as I go through this, okay? So, all right? The, peri the parietal pericardium, all right, this makes the sac that you will see. If you're to dissect the, ch the chest open of somebody, when you open it up, you'll see a sac right there, okay? And when you dissect and pull away some of the fat and other structures there, all right, that, what you're looking at is the parietal pericardium. That's the outer layer of that sac, okay? And then the inner layer that directly lines on the heart, that's the visceral pericardium, okay? And then obviously the space in between is the pericardial cavity. Now, in some situations, and it's a bad situation, all right, because there's lots of blood vessels in these serous membranes, all right, in the pericardial sac, okay? But if you were to tear one of those blood vessels, you can bleed into the pericardial cavity, okay? That's bad, all right? Because what happens to blood after a while once it's out of a blood vessel? What's it do? Well, we'll keep bleeding, but eventually, what stops blood normally? Like when you cut yourself, you eventually stop bleeding, right? It clots. Yeah, it clots. And depending on how much blood that, that is, is bleeding out, all right, eventually as it goes through that clotting process, it doesn't immediately go from a liquid to that hard scab. All right, there's a small transition period depending on how much, but it kind of turns into like a jelly type of consistency, more viscous. Do you, th do you think that your heart would rather be in a liquid environment, like pool, like pool water, or in jello? No, no, no. Would you, well, let me ask you this. Would you rather swim in a pool of water or jello? Water, yeah. Okay, so your heart doesn't want to beat in jello, all right? So when you start to bleed into that pericardial cavity, all right, and depending on how much in there, all right, that pressure of that blood, and if it's there for long enough a time, it coagulates and turns it, it makes it much much more difficult for your heart to function. Cool, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So let's talk about the other body cavity up there in the thoracic cavity. That's the pleura, okay, in the membrane there. All right, the pleura, again, is going to be associated with the lungs, and that's what we call the serous membrane. Same type of relationship, y'all, okay? Two layers and a space in between. Okay, so the layer that lines the actual lung, lungs is the visceral layer, okay? And then the other layer that's going to line the internal surface of the thoracic wall on the inside of the ribs, okay, that's the parietal layer, okay? And then the space in between is called the pleural cavity, right? And that's where you'll have that serous fluid. Now, if somebody gets stabbed in the lungs, does anyone know what it's called if you get stabbed in the lungs and the lung collapses? Yep, that's right. It's pneumothorax. And you'll learn about this more in, um, in 211. All right? But basically, your lungs operate based on a pressure-like system. Okay? And so if you stab somebody, okay, the pressure outside the lungs is much greater than the pressure inside the lungs. So that it's like a submarine that dives too deep into the ocean, it will get crushed if it goes down too deep. Same thing happens to your lungs. The pressure outside cr crushes the, the one lung. It, some people say it's, it's deflated, okay? And what will happen is that parietal cavity is breached because that parietal cavity, uh, or the pleural cavity, excuse me, parietal, pleural cavity helps to keep the lung inflated, 
Right? It has to do with the suction type of property that's involved. Once we break the seal, so to speak, on that suction property, the lung collapses. Okay. All right, this is a great picture. This is the one that you'll probably see on your test, so pay close attention. It's in your book. All right, so this is showing you, all right, our serous uh, membranes, all right, for the heart. So this dark blue line that's surrounding the heart, that's representing the visceral. And again, since we're dealing with the heart, we're going to call it the visceral pericardium. Okay, that's the name. Pericardium is the name for the serous membrane. Okay, and then this uh, light blue all right, coloring represents that pericardial cavity filled with the pericardial fluid or the serous fluid. And then this dark blue line, all right, further away from the heart, that represents the parietal pericardium, okay? All right, down here, here's for our pleura, okay? So you can see the dark blue line that's directly over the lungs. That's the visceral pleura. And then you've got that light blue area there. All right, that's the pleural cavity. And then you can see here that dark blue line that's further away from the lungs, that's gonna be lining the inside of your thoracic cavity, okay? That's your parietal pleura. Do you, do you feel pretty good about that kind of relate? Okay, I don't know if I'm just beating a dead horse, and, but it looks like you all kind of understand. It's hard to, to read your faces when you're wearing masks. It's easier, you know, I can see when people aren't quite sure, so. All right, and then let's just wrap it up here with the body cavities here, all right, and um, get into the abdominal pelvic cavity. All right, so I talked about it earlier. We can subdivide the abdominal pelvic cavity into the two uh, smaller cavities, the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity, okay? So you pretty much in the abdominal cavity, this is where we're going to see a majority of your digestive system, all right? Small intestines, large intestines, all right, liver, stomach, all those organs affiliated with the pancreas and whatnot, kidneys also, all right? When we get down here into the pelvic cavity below the hip bones, again, we'll see kind of like the tail end of your digestive system, pretty much your large intestine, all right, your urinary bladder, some of the uh, uh, internal, obviously, uh, reproductive or sexual organs there, all right, and then uh, the remaining or lower distal portion of the ureters there, okay? So that's going to be sitting down there in the pelvic cavity. All right, so of course, all right, to wrap up the serous membranes here, all right, in the abdominal pelvic cavity, um, the name that we give to the serous membranes in the abdominal pelvic cavity, we call that the peritoneum, okay? Same thing, all right, two-layered serous membrane, all right, that's going to align the entirety of the abdominal pelvic cavity. So, if, again, if you look at the surface of the small intestine, if you look at the surface of the large intestine, stomach, what have you, all right, the external surface of these organs, all right, the serous membrane that lines that area, okay, or that organ or structure is going to be the visceral peritoneum, okay? And then on the inside of your abdominal pelvic wall, all right, it's lining the wall, the internal surface there, that's the parietal peritoneum, all right? And then obviously there's going to be spaces between those two layers. So when you often hear, like you're watching a show like ER or whatever the, any of those medical shows are now, um, Chicago, whatever, The Residents, um, when they talk about people, someone having internal bleeding, all right, they will bleed into this space right here, the peritoneal cavity. Okay, that's usually a common place for an internal bleed to occur. But also, in this space is where that serous fluid is going to be located. Because think about it, a lot of your digestive organs, like your small intestines, especially your large intestines, you're going to have food moving through quite frequently. So even though you might not feel it, there's a lot of activity going on in there. Unless you have diarrhea, then you definitely feel it. But you know what I'm saying. There's a lot of things happening. So when things travel through and move through there, all right, again, it's good to keep the friction down to a minimum. And that's what that serous fluid does in between those two layers. So you're not causing damage and irritation. So this picture here, again, I've seen this on tests. So um, it's in your book, okay? You can see right here, okay, anytime, this is just identified, this is a mid-sagittal cup, but just understand that all these 
pink things are different are are, are, are an organ of some sort. Not a, a different organ. It could be if, especially if it's the small intestine because they just wind back and forth. Point being is, if you see a dark blue line immediately around one of these pink things, that's going to be the visceral peritoneum. Okay. So where's the here's the the visceral peritoneum is pointing to any of these dark blue lines here and here and here. Right. But now if you look for the parietal peritoneum, you've got here's the abdominal wall here. Okay, and that's that dark blue line immediately on the inside. So it's all here and here. Okay, it lines the internal surface of the cavity. Okay, and then the space in between this lighter blue, all right, that's going to be the peritoneal cavity. That's where our serous membrane, our serous fluid is located. And you can bleed into that space. All right, let's finish up with quadrants here, and then we'll be done with uh, general body plan. We can jump into tissues. All right, so abdominal pelvic regions and quadrants, okay? We'll start with the regions first. It looks like a tic-tac-toe board here, okay? So the abdominal pelvic cavity, we divide into, all right, using a tic-tac-toe board, all right, into these uh, regions or compartments, all right? We're going to um, utilize, it depends on what you prefer, okay? I like the uh, quadrant uh, um labeling but i'm going to show you both okay so when we're when we're talking about all right the uh com the nine compartment uh way to label we're going to start with the middle portion all right locate your belly button okay and that is going to be the umbilical region that's where the center all right of this uh, the center square so to speak is going to go so your belly button is going to be somewhere around here okay so Below it here, we refer to that as the hypo, because hypo is below, hypogastric region. Gastric, think of the stomach. Where is the stomach? Way up here. So technically, that is below the stomach. So that's the hypogastric region. That's below the umbilical region. Above the umbilical region is the epigastric. Epi is above. So here's the stomach. Part of this uh, um, quadrant, not quadrant, but region is above the stomach. So we refer to that as the epigastric region. All right, so that's the middle portion. To the left and right of the umbilical region, we call those the, the left and right lumbar regions. Your lumbar spine is your low back, okay? There's five vertebrae that make up the lumbar spine, okay? So there's no ribs affiliated with the lumbar vertebrae. So you will not have any ribs, really. You'll have, you can see a little bit here, all right? But you won't have any ribs attached to the lumbar vertebrae, okay? So the lumbar uh, regions are going to be pretty much between your hip bone, all right, and your 11th and 12th rib, okay? That, that space there, okay? All right. So now we'll go down here to the pelvic area. All right, the, the actual bone that makes up your the top of your hip bone is called the iliac bone, okay? So what we do is we now name this region, the iliac, whatever side we're on, right iliac region or left iliac region. That's where your hip bones are located, all right? And then finally, up here, these two corner areas, we call those the right and left hypochondriac region. Not like a hypochondriac. I know they're very similar, all right? but Chondriac is all is, is, a, is a word that we use to describe cartilage, okay? And your ribs have cartilage on them, all right? They attach, these are called the false ribs here. And these, these, uh, these ribs here, all right, they have their, it's called costocartilage, and it attaches, all right, eventually up here to the sternum. So just think of the hypochondriac, meaning below, all right, the ribs here, okay? That's one way. That's one way how I remember it. All right. I like this quadrant system. It's much easier. Just divide, all right, all right, the body into left and right equal halves and the abdominal pelvic cavity using this kind of cross. And it's real easy, all right? So this is the, the left upper quadrant, right upper quadrant, depending on which anatomical side you're on. And then below the line, usually this goes right through. All right, the center portion here, again, is the umbilicus. Okay, your belly button. Okay, so going out to the left side, that's the left lower quadrant. Going out here to the right side, that's the right lower quadrant. So use the umbilicus as your reference point and then just 
you know, put a crosshairs in there and you go from there. Okay. All right, let's stop that. And I want to start off on tissues. I know you guys are doing awesome. Your brains are